Hi, everyone. So welcome back for our next presentation in the uh, for the afternoon session of the first day of presentations. Um, I'm going to basically hand it up straight over now to Murray Goldschmidt, whose presentation is zero to pwned and with no zero days. Um, I'll, um, if you guys are more than happy to um, uh, post questions uh, throughout the presentation, and then we'll field all of the, um, the questions for Murray at the end of his presentation. So take it away, Murray. Hello and welcome. This is Murray Goldschmidt here, Executive Director for Cyber Capability, Education and Training at CyberCX. Thank you for joining us today at the AusCert 2020 online conference. Today, we're going to have an action-packed presentation on a case study uh, in terms of performing dynamic security testing and why this is so important. We call this zero to pwn with no zero days. In today's presentation, I'm going to cover four main areas. Firstly, in terms of cybersecurity risk management, what information is your organization and board getting versus what they actually need? In terms of risk assessment, there's many different types. We're going to talk today the importance about performing dynamic risk assessments. We're going to uh, deliver a case study on a critical infrastructure assignment that we've conducted as a red team security review or red team penetration test. And we're going to conclude with the learnings from a number of red team tests that we've conducted in the past. In terms of presenting information to your organization, let's consider what your organization's executive and their board need to know. Firstly, business requires visibility. Visibility helps an organization to make informed decisions about the direction that their business is uh, tracking in. It also helps the business to address compliance and ultimately to improve shareholder value. Now, if we look at some of the obligations that directors have, for example, the following graphic comes from the APRA standards. The organization has an obligation to understand about the implementation of security controls within the organization. The organization also has to dem demonstrate effective testing to demonstrate whether or not the controls are actually working. And ultimately, these two things together will uh, be able to help the organization to identify their current information security capability maturity. If we think about security reviews of the past, normally these are done as desktop assignments, as you can see in this image. And normally the assessor, the risk assessor, would be using a methodology consistent with the graphic that you can see on the screen at the moment. The, the assessor is looking at a variety of types of risks and the extent to which they may apply to the business. Now, ordinarily, this is done through interview. A person is interviewing an executive in the organization. Now, I've done a couple of uh, Google searches on risk assessments, and you'd be surprised as to actually what people are presenting and publishing on the internet. I just found this graphic over here, an organization published the results of one of their risk assessments. Now, if you look a little bit uh, closer, you can see that this assessor has identified that the website in their organization is, of, uh, is a critical asset. Clearly, if the website is down, the organization can't conduct their business. But now let's look at the vulnerability that this website presents to the organization. In this case, the assessor has identified that it is unlikely to be affected because the firewall is configured and has good denial of service mitigation in place. Now, anybody who knows anything about denial of service attacks would know that a firewall has little to no capability in its, on its own to defeat or defend against a denial of service attack. There are many different types of denial of service attacks volumetric attacks, state-based attacks, crypto attacks, and of course, application layer attacks as well. So a simple statement such as saying that the firewall is configured uh, properly and, and therefore um, will make the organization in a good position to defend against the denial of service attacks, and therefore the website is uh, being a critical asset is unlikely to be affected, would know that this risk assessment is essentially meaningless. And basically, the organization should take no value based on the assessment, this assessment alone. The problem over here is that the person who was asking the questions wasn't asking the right question. They didn't necessarily understand the type of security issues that would, um, would arise from denial of service. They just took at face value that a firewall was installed and the firewall might provide 
denial of service protection. You see, normally risk assessments are done in a spreadsheet such as this. There are a number of different variables and the assessor goes through identifying the type of incident and the effect that that incident might, may have within the organization. Normally that person then goes and crunches numbers, produces graphs, presents to the organization, and at the end of the day, they say hooray, and they've done their risk assessment. Is it really as simple as that? Not really. In fact, this organization, Equifax, found it out the hard way. They did do security reviews and risk assessments. They just didn't do them very well. In fact, they were one of the, the, the victims of the, one of the largest data breaches known uh, to us in history. Of the 300 plus million uh, people in the US, this breach affected nearly a third of them. In fact, it was such a substantial breach that there were a number of um, inquiries into the organization after the fact. And there's massive settlements occurring afterwards. If you look at some of the commentary around the Equifax data breach, the uh, information that came out of it was quite interesting. This report says that as a corporation that deals with personally identifiable information of over 200 million US customers, Equifax has a legal and moral responsibility to adopt and an effective risk management program that ensures that their customer security is in place. Equifax alone is responsible for identifying and mitigating the risks associated with their assets, including the sites that they use and the third parties that they work with. Think about how you and your organization have an obligation to protect the information that you hold. Furthermore, they went on to say, for too long, organizations have whittled away at prudent security protocols like testing, implementing, and monitoring because they believe the steps will take a chunk out of revenue. Equifax is a perfect case study for this problem. Now think back to your organization as well. Does your mandate to get a product out to market or to get something online very quickly limit your ability to effectively test it? It happens more often than you can think. Let's look at what the government audit office said about the Equifax issue, uh, the, the Equifax breach. They identified five areas where security needed to be improved identification, detection, segmentation, and a failure to rate limit database requests. Those are four of them. All four of those are technical requirements that need to be implemented in the organization. The fifth one, data governance, is the only non-technical control that could have been implemented to, to further secure this organization. Remember that the person conducting the risk assessment might not have come from a technical pedigree. And that's the reason why they identified things such as a firewall being able to prevent a denial of service attack, which we know it can't. So the important thing over here is to provide context for the assessment which you are conducting. And this is the reason why risk assessments cannot be uh, assessed in, a, uh, in a, a single dimension. You need a multi-dimensional review in your organization. And this assessment needs to be dynamic, not static. A static risk assessment, looking at the organization in a single dimension, in a single element, is not going to produce the context for the security of the overall organization. And this is where what we call dynamic testing comes in. You need to profile the organization extensively. Identify the attack vectors that might be attacking your organization. Determine your susceptibility to those vectors. Understand what the response you would have and expect against the stimulus of an attack. And of course, you have to be able to um, change your approach on the fly based on the way that the organization responds. This will provide the most relevant information to your business to help you manage the risk or the context in which you operate. Now look back at the APRA requirements, for example. Remember, they said that you have to test the control effectiveness of the controls that you've got in place. Now, some people might be asking, why? We bought all the technology. Well, look at this organization. They hired a security guard. Now, is this security guard actually going to identify any issues from the, from the people that are coming into this premises? I don't think so. What you really have to do is understand all the risks in your environment. You've got to understand the cumulative effect of the risks, not risks in isolation. And of course, you've got to be able to identify interconnected risks, not treating all risks in a linear manner. So with that, let's look at a case study of an owner and operator of a critical infrastructure. 
we've conducted this assessment and can, are able to provide some great learnings to the audience today. This is actually really timely to, uh, to discuss at the moment. The Australian government is in the process of refining the requirements for protecting critical infrastructure and systems of nat national significance. They released a consultation paper in August 2020. And now at the 17th of September, the, the consultation process has just ended. This particular paper identified the opportunity for the government to expand the definition of uh, what constitutes critical infrastructure or systems of national significance in the Australian market. Now, if you look on the right-hand side over here, there are a huge number of industries which the net would now effectively capture. So if you were thinking today that your organization wasn't considered critical infrastructure, that may change very soon, particularly where you identify something such as data and the cloud, which affects almost every business today. Now, if we look at the obligations that the organizations have in defeating and defending uh, um, systems of critical importance to the, to the uh, Australian public, there are particular requirements that have to be met. In particular, they identify that you need to take an all hazards approach when identifying and understanding risks. Remember, an all hazards approach on a desktop exercise. Further, they say that the organization has to have appropriate risk management, including evaluation and testing, but the tests must identify the outcomes of security. This means that you cannot rely extensively on desktop exercises alone. You have to conduct online dynamic tests to identify all the risks that you are subjected to. Now let's look at our case study organization. They're no different to most. They've got an office in the city. They've got an outsourced contact center. They've got an open plan office where people come into the office and conduct their business. They also have data centers. In this case, they're not using cloud extensively, critical infrastructure. They've got a number of on-premise data centers. They've also invested in a very expensive 24 by seven SOC monitoring service. They've got good physical security in the foyer of their building. They've also got good physical security to get into the tenancy themselves. Now this organization has been in business for a long period of time. They are in fact ISO 27001 compliant and they've got a risk management framework implemented as you can see over here. They do identify risks, they evaluate risks and they treat those risks. This is all part of the ISMS, the Information Security Management System for ISO 27001. Now, while this organization was pretty confident about their ISO 27001 security posture, they appointed us to conduct a goal-oriented risk assessment. We also call this a red team penetration test. Now, red team penetration testing, the terminology can sound pretty confronting. So if you don't want to use confronting terminology in your organization, call it a goal-oriented risk assessment, and you might be able to get your security review across the line. In this case, our client appointed us to achieve an, a number of particular um, uh, goals within the assessment. Number one, to gain access to their network, then compromise their Microsoft Active Directory domain, then locate, access, and exfiltrate the primary data assets, gain access to their TLS private keys, and ultimately compromise the isolated system which was responsible for delivering critical services. And this was deep within their network and not publicly accessible at all. Our approach, we had to perform reconnaissance. We had to identify all of the, the footprint that this organization had um, on, online. We then needed to identify and craft some attacks, ultimately with the goal of having persistent remote access into the environment and then achieve each one of those five goals. So if we talk about reconnaissance, how did we conduct this? Firstly, we would be able to enumerate the entire external perimeter as much as possible, identifying the organization's domain names, DNS record, IP address space, all of their service providers that they engage with. We can then start crafting a multi-threaded attack plan to identify the weakest areas. Of course, people are known to be pretty weak, so we'd form intelligence gathering on as many employees as possible. Now, of course, the organization has a number of physical tenancies. They've got an office in the city. They've got data centers where their data is stored. They probably have some remote sites as well. And of course, sometimes electronic signals emanate beyond the physical boundaries of the tenancy, such as wireless networking, which is normally 
a good way to get into a corporate environment if it isn't secured well. Now, as part of our security review and, and profiling, we identified that the organization had their email online on Office 365. That's very common these days. And in fact, they'd implemented security pretty well in Office 365, implementing multi-factor authentication for user-based remote access. However, Microsoft Office 365 is a very configuration-centric platform, and they had not implemented multi-factor authentication on all of the remote access interfaces, particularly PowerShell administrative interface. With access to this, we were able to uh, conduct a password spraying attack against the exposed interfaces. We were able to identify a number of accounts in which the passwords were weak, probably because they were defined once at, at uh, account creation. The person never joined the organization for whatever reason, and the password was never changed. At this point, we had uh, uh, the opportunity to gain access to the organization remotely. However, we were then prompted with the organization's multi-factor authentication. But being inquisitive people, we weren't going to stop there. Multi-factor authentication is strong. However, the configuration is where is normally where things get let down. And this wasn't an exception over here. This organization allowed us to install a local copy of Outlook, which we did. And if you look at the local of um, the local configuration, they did not restrict your ability to enroll an alternative phone number in order to get the multi-factor authentication code. So in this case, instead of using the defined phone number, we put our office phone number in as the method to actually get the MFA code. You see, we weren't actually bypassing MFA here. We just enrolled ourselves into the MFA and then used that MFA to get access to the organization. Remember, multi-factor authentication is strong. However, it is only as good as it is configured. And configuration is normally where people can get in and bypass security controls. So with this, we were able to get an MFA code and be able to load up the Outlook client and ultimately get access into the Office 365. However, Office 365 being a cloud environment did not enable us to get access into the corporate environment. And remember, most of the goals are deep within this organization's corporate environment. However, having access to the Office 365 environment is very useful because it can help you to craft email attacks and, and potentially uh, further your um, uh, phishing and, um, and attacks against people because you've got access directly into the systems in which they're uh, using to communicate with each other. This organization, again, so, uh, because they were about pretty well established, um, did not have any vulnerabilities that we could exploit in their wireless networking. So that angle did not work. Of course, their people also were pretty um, uh, resilient against attack. Our social engineering attacks, which normally work, and our phishing attacks, which would also normally work, did not work in this case. Again, because the organization was actually quite diligent in implementing good education within the business. However, just a quick tip to the, to the listeners today. If you want to get good at hacking, I suggest that you take up smoking. Why? Because if you actually spend a little bit of time staking out the organization, you can become friendly with the smokers who normally go down to the, uh, the street level to have their smoke breaks. And over a period of days, you can actually strike up a friendship. This then gives you the opportunity to uh, leverage that, um, that friendship and actually exploit it for the benefit of getting into the corporate tenancy. So if you follow the smokers, you can normally go up in the, in, in the lift and enter into the office at the same time as them, essentially tailgating into the organization. At this point, once you've got tailgated into the organization, what we want to do is implement one of these technical devices called a LAN turtle. A LAN turtle is a small device which will plug into the USB port of a computer and also has got access to the 3G network remote access, and you plug the ethernet of the company's corporate domain to the other interface. Now, we tried to do this in this organization. Again, they had many security controls. For example, network access control, the MAC, which prevented us bringing in foreign devices into the environment. Well, that attack vector didn't work, but snooping around the office, we were able to find the IT room. Now, in the IT room, this is where technicians get the computers ready 
uh, for deployment for new users, or they perform repairs on computers that need to be fixed. Now, in this case, because the, the, uh, the technicians need to get the computers on the network and patched, this is an area in the environment where network access control is whitelisted. This gave us the opportunity to install our LAN turtle directly in an area which was visible to technicians, but was able to be, hidden. in this case, hidden in plain sight. We just put a sticker on it that said, do not remove, plug the device into the corporate network, and also had the 3G remote access back channel back to our office. And with this, we had achieved goal number one. We were able to access the corporate network. Now, while we were in that IT room, we found a desktop computer. We also found that the security controls were not consistently applied. Laptop computers in this organization did have um, uh, full disk encryption, which means that we couldn't decrypt the hard drive of a laptop computer. However, desktop computers did not have full disk encryption. This is a common mistake. All computers in organizations should use full disk encryption. So what we were able to do was boot an alternative Linux operating system on a desktop computer and then access the accounts that were used to, um, to access this computer in the past. And of course, the system administrator was logging in as the domain administrator. This gave us the opportunity to crack the domain admin password offline. And with this, we were then able to bind to the genuine Active Directory server in the, in the organization, with the domain, average, domain administrator privileged access and pull out the entire list of users in the environment. We can use tools such as Mimikatz to do this. We could then take the time to crack all the passwords offline. This took a couple of days. While we had uh, remote access to the environment, we were then able to finish the attack and compromise the entire domain. This allowed us to achieve goal number two. Now we needed to snoop around the environment, trying to get further and further to achieve our other goals. We found a file server in this environment. And of course, being a very diligent organization, they were storing a lot of information. Unfortunately, there were no role-based access controls in the file server, which means that a lot of sensitive information was generally available to anybody who could get access to the file server. Now, remember, at this point, we were actually still using a domain administrative credential. We probably shouldn't have been because we had, we had uh, compromised all of the user credentials in the environment. But at this point, we still were using the domain administrative credential to actually traverse the file server. And at this time, this expensive 24 by seven SOC offering should have identified that domain privileged credentials were being used for non-domain uh, privileged uh, re access requirements. However, they were asleep at the wheel and did nothing. Now this organization, again, as I've mentioned, they had ISA 27001 compliance. Part of this requires good practices around change and uh, change management and access control management. And they very diligently filled in a lot of information about access into the core data environment when they had upgraded the system. Now we could use this information to our advantage because we knew the user who was the uh, assigned administrator for that system, and we knew the target IP address of where that system was on the network. Now, unfortunately, this administrator was doing what we call password reuse. For, the, for convenience, this administrator was using the same Active Directory password as password to access the system, which was not connected to the directory. So with a password reuse attack, because we had compromised the entire domain, we then uh, were able to use that credential to access a critical server. And at this point, we then extracted all of the data from the system. Now, of course, this data was still encrypted because I remember the organization had quite diligently implemented a lot of security controls. Now, how do you decrypt the data if the data is encrypted? Well, you have to find a decryption key. But remember our administrator, was logging in as domain administrator. We had the domain admin credential. We were able to find the online enterprise grade web-based internal password vault. And within this password vault, we were able to find the keys that were used to encrypt the data. And that same key to encrypt the data 
could be used to decrypt the data because it was symmetric key encryption and decryption. Now, remember about the guy, uh, the security guard that's not really doing very much. The same thing was happening with the SOC at this time. This particular product was producing alerts on privileged access credential requests. So every time we were requesting access to credentials, such as the encryption keys or the decryption keys, it generated an alert. But the 24 by 7 SOC was asleep at the wheel again. And as we extracted the data key, the 24 by 7 SOC raised no alert at all to our attack. And with this, we were able to achieve goal number three. We were able to locate, access, and exfiltrate the primary data assets and decrypt them. On to the next task. We needed to gain access to the TLS private keys. Now, for those who know a bit about private public key encryption, there are two different keys, not like symmetric encryption. This is there is a public key and a private key. Now, the private key is essential to remain private and secret because that data can only be de decrypted by the, pair, by the paired key for which you need to have the public and private key together. Now, in this case, where would you find the private keys? Well, we went to the file server and found a folder called keys. Now, of course, the organization being diligent didn't just leave their private keys there alone. They had put a passphrase, in fact, quite a long and strong complex passphrase, but the, which protected the key itself. So getting the private key alone did not allow you to exploit it because you had to get a passphrase to unlock the private key. But remember, we had access to this online system. And remember, it was generating logs, but the SOC provider wasn't doing anything about it. Well, we were able to find the passphrase to decrypt the private keys. And with that, we were able to access the private keys for the not only the administrative website that they used to configure their system, but also the critical infrastructure website. And as a bonus, we were also able to access the TLS private key for the network access control system. Now with this, we were able to actually whitelist our own um, IPs and MAC addresses and devices so that we could maintain persistence in their environment anywhere in the corporate environment, not just the IT um, uh, technical room where they were doing computer repairs. So we could enroll ourselves into the network access control and maintain persistence forever, essentially, in their environment. And with this, we had achieved goal number four. Now, goal number five was quite complicated. We had to compromise the very critical system that was deep within their environment. Now, in, if you're familiar with the terminology defense in depth, this is just a sample example. It's not the exact example of our client environment. The idea of defense in depth is that you've got multiple layers of controls to get to a sensitive system deep within the network. And you've essentially got to zigzag your way across the environment to ultimately get to your system that, uh, that you need to uh, target and attack. Now, we were able to get a blueprint of the environment because, again, the information was published on their file server with little to no access controls restricting access to the information. And while that should have raised an alert, the SOC was no, none the wiser to us traversing the network or getting documentation out about how the environment was set up. To make things a little bit more complicated, there was a VPN between two firewalls, not a public VPN, an internal VPN, but the user credentials to use the VPN to traverse to get into the sensitive part of the network was bound into Active Directory. Now remember, we had compromised the Active Directory, so we had the credentials to be able to create a VPN. What would have been better at this point was if the organization had used multi-factor authentication to initiate the VPN. However, it probably would have just added a little bit of time to our attack because since we were domain administrators, we could have enrolled ourselves as um, into the MFA system and ultimately would have been able to get into the VPN as well. It just would have added some cost to our attack. So at this point, we were able to find the ultimate server which ran the critical infrastructure. Now, this server was not on the domain. It was hosted independently and had an independent username and password. But, and it was also not pass, uh, subject to password reuse. We found, we tried all of the, the domain um, passwords that we could. But what we did find was that there was a local password database, not the centralized online web password database, 
but an independent encrypted file. However, it was strongly secured and encrypted, and we could not crack that password safe in a reasonable period of time. However, we did find what's called a roaming profile for the administrator. Now, a roaming profile is a directory in Active Directory that allows the administrator to have a consistent look and feel no matter where they are in the corporate environment because they the profile, the environmental profile, roams with you as you move around the environment. Now, in this roaming profile, we were able to find what is called the Firefox online credential cache. Now, of course, rule number one, guys, never, ever put your password into a browser and allow the, the browser to remember it. It's great for convenience, but it's really, really bad for security. Most of these tools do not have good security protocols for protecting credentials within the browser. We were able to find a vulnerability in the Firefox um, uh, uh, product, and we were able to actually crack the passwords in uh, that were on that particular device. Now, this administrator, unfortunately, had saved his credentials in that uh, Firefox password safe, and with that, we were able to get elevated administrative privileges directly into the ultimate critical system deep within their network. And with that, we had achieved all of the goals. Now, we call this a living off the land attack because all goals were achieved without exploiting any vulnerabilities. We just used the, the, the tools that were on the operating systems to actually um, um, move and navigate our way horizontally and vertically, vertically within the environment. We did not bring any tools into the environment. We did not run any vulnerability scans. We did not identify any vulnerabilities in the environment that could be exploited. It all arose from getting physical access into the environment and getting a device onto the network. And from there, we were able to move and control the entire attack remotely. Now, this organization, remember, had a number of good security controls in place. They were ISO 27001 compliant. They did have good network access controls. They did outsource their security monitoring to an external party. They had technology galore. They had firewalls, VPN, vulnerability management, anti-malware, every sort of endpoint software you can think of. They did have multi-factor authentication on remote access. They did have multi-factor authentication on email. They did have strong passwords. They did have a password vault. They weren't storing their passwords in an Excel file on a file server. And they did have good privileged access management controls, but they weren't monitoring them properly. They did have good physical security controls in the office environments. However, they were let down by a few things. Number one, we were able to get physical access to the office by becoming friendly with the smokers and ensuring that we could actually tailgate into the office. They had assumed that they had good security controls in Office 365, but we were able to bypass them because they never tested it themselves. Their MFA was not con uh, uh, correctly configured. They were using privileged access credentials to do maintenance jobs, which they shouldn't have. And we were able to exploit that. And remember that they didn't have good uh, BIOS security because they were not consistently implementing um, full disk encryption on desktop computers and laptops. And of course, they were doing that number one cardinal sin, password reuse. That'll get you every single time. Ensure that you don't reuse your passwords across systems. You always have to have an independent, unique, long and strong password for every single system that you use. And of course, once the domain is compromised, everything fell like falling dominoes. And of course, unfortunately, that very expensive 24 by seven SecOps provider was asleep at the wheel. They might have been getting alerts, but they required manual intervention. It wasn't automated. And manual intervention is normally where things go wrong because people actually can't identify and respond to the threats in the speed at the speed at which they need to. And of course, they had a lot of sensitive information on their file server. The information was good and consistent with their ISA 27001 requirements to document everything, but they did not put role-based access controls. They did not encrypt that data or prevent access into that data only for particular uh, users. So we were able to find all the information about the systems that we needed. Now remember, this organization did have good risk management and they were doing assessments like this one over here. But the problem with a spreadsheet or desktop-based risk assessment is that it is linear and static. 
what you need to do for this organ for an organization like this is consider the uh, the security of the organization in the context in which the organization operates, not within isolation. Isolation looks at each security issue on its own. But remember, the organization is an ecosystem of security technologies and an ecosystem of systems. Therefore, a looking at something in isolation is not going to give you the full picture. Remember, this organization had no vulnerabilities. They were diligently patching everything. They were really actually good on their security operational tasks. But we didn't actually have to compromise any vulnerabilities because we just used the systems that were native in the environment, as I demonstrated, to move horizontally and vertically within the business. Therefore, what this demonstrates is the requirement to assess your risks dynamically. Now, a dynamic risk assessment is another way of calling a red team penetration test. A red team penetration test, as we've indicated over here, is a multi-threaded, parallel, goal-oriented security review. If the term penetration testing or red team testing is a little confronting for your organization, call it a dynamic risk assessment, and it's more likely to get across the line. Now, if you don't want to look at this only from the perspective of the attacker, you can look at this from the perspective of the defender as well. This is called a blue team assessment. Now, in this case, this organization really did need some blue teaming because they were, they were logging and producing alerts on a number of activities, but they just weren't acting on them. And that's because they probably hadn't tuned their systems and had never actually bothered to test the scenarios against which the systems were implemented to secure. And when you blend a red team assessment with a blue team assessment, you get what we call a purple team assessment. Those are the blended colors together. And that's where you look at things from both the attacker's and defender's perspective. And that's ultimately where I recommend that you get to in your organization. With this, let's just do a quick summary. Three quick takeaways. Number one, cyber risk assessments require context. You need to understand your environment, your business systems, and the attack factors that are likely apply to you specifically. Do not rely on just doing things um, in a generic manner as a desktop assessment. A risk assessment is really only as good as the scope of what you're looking at. Choosing a narrow scope will only protect you against a subset of possible threats. You really need to look at all of the threats and ask the right questions, not just a bunch of questions that come off a spreadsheet. Remember, you have to apply the risk assessment to the context for the organization and the context for the environment in which you operate in. And attacks generally exploit technical weaknesses and people. Buying technology doesn't fix this. Most of the issues relate to configuration and implementation and ongoing management. So there is an element of configuration management that needs to be secured. And of course, people in general are the weak link. Now, you need to ensure that there is adequate ongoing cybersecurity education and therefore cybersecurity literacy within the business. And that requires what we call boardroom to basement security education approaches. You need to have everybody cyber literate in your business to develop a cyber secure workforce that you need to ensure that your business is resilient. You need this at the board level, you need this at the executive level, you need it at an administrative level, you need it at a development level, and you need it at a functional level for every single role and function in your business. Education is the number one priority today. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. My name is Murray Goldschmidt, the Executive Director for Cyber Capability, Education and Training at CyberCX. My details are on the screen now. Please feel free to contact me at any time, and I'd be pleased to discuss your security requirements with you or any questions that you've got about this presentation. Thank you very much and have a great day.